dive in. Well, earlier this week, I was invited to a workshop that was organized uh, by our district. Um, and with my schedule as full as it is, I just wasn't sure about investing a, a full day to drive an hour north um, and, and commit my time to it. Uh, I was honored, obviously, to have been invited. But as, uh, as you know, we get invited to all sorts of things, and we can't, uh, we can't say yes to everything um, that we're invited to. You can't do everything. Uh, but I ended up deciding to go, and I'm glad I did. It was well worth my investment. And what pushed me to decide to go was not necessarily the content of the worship, workshop, although that was important, and I'm always up for learning new things, but it was who was leading the workshop. I trusted that it was going to be worth my time because the leader that was leading the workshop has always delivered great encouragement and great teaching at anything that I've ever been to where he was leading. And so I went because Steve was leading the workshop. I trusted in faith that it was going to be worth my time, and it was. Uh, I had faith that it would be worth it, and it was. Uh, because of my past experience with him, because I trust him, because I know that he is uh, uh, always prepared and, and well thought of uh, in our uh, movement, um, I, I went because of my trust in him. Now, I want you to th remember that and think of that as we move through the message this morning. This week, we're starting a short series that we're calling Faith, Hope, and Love. I don't know if you've ever read that in the scripture. I know some of you are nodding your head, heads, which comes from uh, chapter uh, uh, 1, I'm sorry, chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians, popularly known as the love chapter. If you've been to a few weddings, uh, you've probably heard this read, maybe a little out of context, but I don't want to ruin your wedding day, however long ago it was. Um, so as we set out today, I want to start in that text first, and then we're going to get into our main text out of the book of Hebrews, known as the faith chapter, or the hall of faith. Now in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul has just finished uh, discussing and listing how spiritual gifts and good works are all noise if they are devoid of love. And then, of course, he then describes the many attributes of love and finally finishes with the statement, love never fails. Now, I want you to hold on to that truth over the next few weeks because love, the way that Jesus described it, the way that he lived it out, is the fruit of our faith, okay? So let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, as the chapter finishes, Paul writes, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. These are all gifts. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. And just, just a note on that, mirrors back then were not like mirrors today. They, you would see your image, but it was blurry and, and, and faint. He says, uh, we, for now we only see a, a reflection as in a mirror, then we, see, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall, now, shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these th three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now these are the foundation for the spiritual life. Uh, and they're maybe easy to understand conceptually, but a whole lot harder to live out. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. All right. I don't know about you, but I've always uh, thought of these three things as three different layers of a pyramid. For some reason, it looks like a pyramid in my mind. It could be a square building. I don't know. But for me, it's a pyramid. One truth building upon the other. None of them are able to fully be realized without the others. Now, I know that might sound contradictory, 
given that we just read that Paul is emphasizing that love is the greatest. And I say that because normally when we talk about something that's important, we usually put it at the base, at the foundation. We say, this is foundational. But here, love is like the city on the hill that can be seen from all around. But you see, it can't be seen unless it's built upon something else, namely faith and hope. Are you tracking with me? So you can't really have eternal hope without faith. And you can't truly love the way that the gospel urges us to love unless you have faith and hope. The three are inextricably tied together. And faith, which we're going to focus in on today, is essentially crucial to the other two to be a reality in our lives. Now to the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer is reminding and describing hardship that those early followers of Jesus had faced and indeed were still facing when they received this letter and as the church grew and expanded. And he makes this statement as an encouragement for some and maybe a reminder for others who are reading it. He says in Hebrews 10, But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. He's saying, listen, you are facing hardship right now. I know it. You will face hardship in the future. And he's urging them to understand that followers of Jesus face those hardships differently than everybody else. They live into faith when the going gets tough. Now, to our main text for today, I'm not going to read through the entire chapter this morning. I thought about it, and I thought it would take up half of my time, but I'm going to reference a lot of it this morning. And if you have your Bibles, you certainly can uh, follow along because I'm going to be rifling off uh, verse numbers as we move forward. Uh, But let me set it up for you. Hebrews 11, as I've already mentioned, is often referred to as the faith chapter or the hall of faith. And the purpose, as I alluded to already, is to inspire and encourage the Jesus followers of the day to walk with God, especially as they faced hardship and persecution. And after the first few verses, which we're going to read in a moment, the writer, we're not sure who the writer was. Some say it was Paul. Some say it was Barnabas. We don't really know. All that matters to me is that it was inspired by God, that God wrote the scripture through human authors. And we don't know who it was, but that's okay, because God is behind it all. Uh, The writer gives numerous examples of women and men who persevered through trials by exercising faith in God. 17 specific examples and then a few broader examples. Now, I want to be clear before we take a look at some of the biblical names that he mentions that some of these people that show up in the hall of faith are a little surprising, and none of them were perfect. And the encouragement for me here, and hopefully for you, is that in a very real sense, they were just normal people like you and I that saw extraordinary things that God did in and through them. And it all hinged on them exercising faith in him, faith in his character, faith in his promises, faith in his goodness. Let's take a look at the opening statements here in Hebrews 11. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients, or some translations say the elders or the patriarchs patriarchs were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. God looked upon the earth, he said, let there be light, and there was light, right? He created something out of nothing. He's the only one that can do that. Now, let me repeat that. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I wonder this morning how that statement hits you. Is that something that you find easy or hard to do? You see, we can count on all that God has promised, but the reality is 
some of what he has promised, and the writer alludes to this at the end of chapter 11, won't be realized in our lives fully until we have met him face to face. And so we're holding on to the promises of God, some of which will not be realized until we've taken our last breath. But brothers and sisters, you need to know that today God is working in your lives. And his promises are real to you. And he's faithful and true. And he will bring those things to the surface and follow through on his word to you. Now you might be asking, how do we know that he's going to come through on his promises? Not just in the end, but even now as we are living our lives. And the answer to that question is multi-layered. We can believe in faith that God will come through for us based on his, I've already mentioned it, character and his promises, both past and present. And we can trust that God, because God has the whole picture, which we most certainly do not. I don't know if you guys have the whole picture. You guys know how everything works together? I don't. I don't think you do either. But he has the whole picture. And, and with his knowledge and wisdom and, and, and the purpose by which uh, he, uh, we can trust him, uh, we can trust him in the direction that he is leading both us and the rest of the world. And the reason behind whatever circumstances that we find ourselves in, he knows the reason for that. And as some of you need to hear today that God has a plan for your life. You might have heard that before, but let me say it again. God has a plan for your life. Amen. He thought of you before you were a thought to your parents. He formed you together in your mother's womb. And he has a purpose and a plan for you. And even if you haven't figured out quite what that plan is, know and be confident this morning that he has a plan for you. Now, there's three different kinds of faith, which I want to mention real quickly because my time is limited. The first is saving faith, and, and we can read about that in a number of different places. Ephesians 2.8 is what came to my mind, and this is a faith that brings us into relationship with Jesus. Paul writes in Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. And I thank God for that. But then there's a gift of faith, which is a spiritual gift. Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about the various spiritual gifts. And this is a spiritual gift that provides for some extraordinary trust in God during difficult times. I don't know if you've ever met somebody like that. Everything is falling apart all around them. There's chaos in front of us. And they're like, everything's going to be good. It's all good. God has got our back. He uh, is faithful and true. And, and, and that is a spiritual gift of, of an inner peace that God gives some where they can face chaos and be okay, be grounded. And then finally, there's living by faith, which is a daily trust in God's character and promises beyond just that initial faith or the gift of faith that I just talked about. And this is the kind of faith that the writer of Hebrews is talking about here in chapter 11. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this chapter, the writer details 17 different people in the biblical narrative who exercise this living faith in the face of uncertainty. And I want to give you a brief overview of who shows up and tell you just a little bit about their story. We don't have time to get into every one of their stories. And I, I, I understand that maybe not everybody knows their stories. And I wish I could I don't know, maybe that's, another, maybe that's another sermon series. But here we go. Verse 4, he talks about Abel. Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, and his faith was commended as righteousness. He offered a blood sacrifice to God, and God was pleased. Enoch, in verse 5 and 6, was taken from this life without experiencing death because by faith he pleased God. 
Verse 7, Noah, by faith, some of you know Noah, right, built an ark in his backyard. He built this thing for years. All of his neighbors scoffed at him. They made fun of him. They said, you're crazy. What are you doing? It has never rained up until this point. They don't know what droplets from the, are, are that are coming from the sky. The only way the earth was watered at that point was just a mist upon the earth. And so they'd never seen rain. And Noah says, you better get in the boat because it's about to rain. And by faith... He got on that boat, and he lived, even in the face of something that was unseen. Abraham, in verse uh, 8 and 10, by faith obeyed God's call to go to an unknown place, not knowing the destination, and lived as a stranger in the promised land. How many of you know that sometime God, sometimes God asks you to stay, take a step, and he's going to tell you where you're going when you're on the move? That takes a lot of faith. I'm not always ready to take that type of faith, uh, take that step of faith. But sometimes God says, all right, move in this direction. I'm not going to tell you where you're going yet, but I will tell you on the way. And there's an abiding in that, in that, in that relationship with God that we can trust him, that he's going to lead us to where he wants us to go as we're walking along the road. It's hard to do. I remember... In our early, early in our marriage, almost 26 years ago, after working two years at a church, we were both, my wife and I were both school teachers, we felt very strongly, and I know I've said this before at Newbridge, but we felt very strongly that, that God had it called us to kind of quit our jobs and move to New York City. Uh, for me, it was moving back home, but for Becky, it was all new. And our friend at the time, uh, one of my bosses said, and I won't tell you which one, school or church, he said, well... I guess maybe you, you'll, you'll figure it out. God doesn't work that way anymore. Well, I'm here to tell you that, yes, he does. Sometimes he tells you, hey, you've got to let go of what is comfortable. You know, my wife was a tenured teacher, and for school teachers, that's like the golden prize, right? I heard now it takes, my daughter's a teacher, I heard it takes four years to get tenure instead of three. But when you get there, it's like school teachers are like, hey, we've arrived. You know, as long as we don't beat a kid, we're like, we have got job security. <laughs> we have got job security, right? And people, my colleagues thought we were, I was crazy. What are you doing? Where are you going? Why are you? I, don't, I didn't have the answer. And it turned out as I moved along that path, God would show me along the way. And I got to tell you, there were some dark moments when I moved. I remember we moved to Queens. I was 50 feet from four tracks of the Long Island Railroad. And I said to myself, what have I done? And in that first year, constantly asking God, God, why have you brought me here? What purpose do you have for me? And it became clear as I walked along the road. Uh, let's see. Sarah. Sarah. Verses 11 and 12, by faith she was able to bear children despite being barren for her entire life. And by the way, she was in her 90s. And God said, I'm going to give you a child. And she kept on saying, when? And there were some choices made along the way that were not according to his plan. But yet God was true to his promise and she bore a child. Abraham, having finally become a father, in verse 17 to 19, he was also in his late 90s. Now, he's had what God, now he has the son that God had promised him, and, prompt, and God prompted him to offer Isaac up as a sacrifice, not knowing how it was going to work out, believing that God could resurrect the dead. He brings this son, this promised son, that was a miracle and he offers him up to God as a sacrifice. And it was a test, and God saw that Abraham passed the test. Jacob, in verse 21, by faith, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped uh, God while he was leaning on his staff. Joseph, in verse 22, in faith, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites to the promised land and asked that his bones would be returned to his homeland. Moses, uh, Moses' parents in verse 23, by faith, hid him for three months, seeing, seeing that he was no ordinary child. 
Moses, in verse 24 to 28, by faith, led the Israelites, God's people, out of Egypt and chose repeatedly to be mistreated by God's enemies and by his own people. And the, and the, and the scripture says here in Hebrews 11, regarding disgrace for Christ, interesting that the writer mentions Christ in this Hebrew Bible Old Testament story, as greater value than Egypt's treasures. If you know the story, remember what the Israelites said as they were wandering in the desert. Hey, let's go back to Egypt where we know what to expect. We got to eat this bread from heaven every day. We got to wonder where our water is coming from. What are we doing, Moses, wandering around this desert for 40 years? And yet, Moses faithfully trusted in God's promise, leading his children to the promised land. Israelites in verse 29, by faith, now think about this, passed through uh, the, the, uh, the divided Red Sea as on dry land. And, and I just always wonder, like as they are walking through this great sea, and I've seen it with my own eyes, the, the Red Sea, it's split in part, and, the, and I don't know if it looked like the Hollywood movie where the walls are just kind of like the walls of water are like moving, but like they're threatening to come down. You know, you have to wonder as you walk through the seabed, you wonder, okay, it takes a certain level of faith to, to, to believe that God is going to keep those walls of water uh, split and divided for you to pass through, and yet that's exactly what he did. And in Jericho, verse 30, by faith marched around the walls of Jericho for seven days and would see them crumble before their eyes. And what did they do? Essentially, they sang worship music. Don't miss the power of worship. Let me tell you, the enemy of your soul hates when we worship. And you might think it's just music and words, but let me tell you something. There is something happening in the heavenlies when we declare the truth of God, when we declare the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, when we declare the salvation that God freely gives us by his sacrifice. The enemy of your soul hates worship, and so we worship boldly in this place, that this is the house of God, and we declare his goodness and his praises in this place. And finally, Rahab, in verse 31, by faith welcomed the spies and was spared from destruction. Now, there's more that the writer mentions, but I think that you get the point. None of these people, listen to me, none of these people had the roadmap as to how everything was going to work out, but they trusted, yes, imperfectly at times, but they trusted God with the outcome because of who he was and is and because of his character and his promises to them. Thank God that they did. And here they show up in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith, imperfect as they were, and yet living out in faith based on God's goodness and his character. You know, sometimes people pray for clarity. I've done it. I just need clarity. Jesus, I need clarity around this thing. And sometimes God I believe, purposely does not give us clarity so we can trust in his goodness. Because in some sense, when we're asking for clarity, we're asking for the roadmap, and God is not going to give us the entire roadmap. That's why it's called faith. We have to trust him who is greater and higher than us in his purposes and his plan for our lives, and that's difficult to do, isn't it? And yet, because he's God and we are not, we trust in his goodness and his character, that he's faithful and true and his promises are good. And I wonder, are you willing and ready to exercise that kind of faith in your life? Now, I want to spend the rest of our time highlighting something very specific that the writer says is the key ingredient. He doesn't use those words, but it's a key ingredient to living out faith in this way. And what is that? It's sight, which sounds completely counterintuitive. 
There's an interesting thing that unfolds in this chapter, and I encourage you to read the chapter in its entirety after church today, maybe sometime this week. But there's an interesting thing that unfolds here that, it, that the author points out is a spiritual sight. That faith seems to involve seeing what is unseen with our earthly eyes. Let me say that again. It, it's a, it points to a spiritual sight that faith seems to involve seeing what is unseen with our earthly eyes. And there are eight verses which mention some kind of spiritual sight, which I'm going to put up on the screen there for you, and we're going to rifle through them real quick. You ready, Julian? All right, I think he's ready. <laughs> Verse 1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for. We've already read this. And for an assurance about what we do not see. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Verse 10, he was looking, he was looking forward, meaning Abraham. He was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Verse 14, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Verse 23, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. Well, how did they know that? Verse 26, count, continuing on in Moses' story, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. And finally, verse 27, by faith, he left Egypt, meaning Moses, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. He saw him who was invisible. So friends, faith involves at its core a kind of sight, not a physical sight, but a spiritual sight. Sight. And this is why Paul, I believe Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what on is what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary or temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. Amen. So I need to ask you this morning, can you see? Are you looking? Can you perceive things that nobody else can, not because you're super special and you've got 20-20 vision, because I don't. I can see you kind of, you know. but because God has given you a spiritual sight. He's given you a heavenly sight where you can perceive things that nobody else can see or some others cannot see, but you can see it because you see in the spiritual realm. When you've experienced some kind of loss, you've lost something or someone that were dear to you. Can you see God at work in spite of that loss? And I know, I know you can. I know some of your stories, and I know that you can see. When you feel that you are surrounded by people attacking you or feel the attack of the enemy of your soul, are you looking for God to deliver you? Amen. When you're living paycheck by paycheck, and, and trust me, I've experienced that in my life, pinching pennies everywhere you can, working the second or even the third job to provide for your basic needs or the needs of those in your family, can you see that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, that he first feeds the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, that he will provide for you your needs according to his riches in glory? Can you see that? Amen. Can you perceive it? 
and friends in our world and in our country with the political divisions that we're experiencing. And I know divi- the p- politics have always been divisive, but we're in, a, we're in an era, in a season that I've never seen in my lifetime, and I know many of you have not seen in your lifetime. With the, p- the political divisions and, and, and the wars going on around the, ro- the globe, can you see that God is sovereign and that his hand is at work? Listen, who are you going to trust in? I mean, seriously, let's just be real. I'm going to be real forward with you. Who are you trusting in? The Democrats? Come on, I'm I'm an equal opportunity offender. The Republicans? Seriously. I'm serious. Jesus follower. Who are you trusting in? Trust me, those politicians are not going to lay down their lives to save you, regardless of what they might promise you. Mm. And maybe it's not clear to you, but it is abundant, abundantly clear to me that neither Joe Biden or Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi or Mike Johnson or Chuck Schumer or all of the rest of them in Washington can do anything to care for my soul or to provide for me the things that I need. Not only to survive in this world, but to thrive. But the Savior can. Jesus can, and he does. Listen, friends, in my humanity, I don't know how all the things are going to work out. I don't have the master plan, but he does. And I can see that, and I can hope in him, and you can as well, because of his character, because of his mighty works in the past, because of his promises for the future, and even the present, I can stand on a firm foundation knowing that everything is going to work out in the end, because he is faithful and true, because he personally has worked in my life in the past, and he is working in my life in the present, and I have faith a seeing faith that he will continue to work into my future for all of the days of my life, however many he gives me. Jesus Christ, as he was going to the cross, facing the difficulty of what he knew he would be facing with his execution and public shame and humiliation, says to his Father in heaven, can you take this cup from me? He was wrestling in his humanity with the hardship of the path that God had called him to walk. And you know, that comforts me because even the Son of God in his humanity struggled with hardship and yet he would ultimately say to the Father, what? Not my will, but your will be done. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for that. He could see. Will you have that kind of faith when you're facing life's challenges? Listen, I know this is not easy stuff. Life is hard. It's difficult. And there are times where we choose to take our own path because we think we know better. And God says, hey, come over here. Walk this way. He's gentle. He's loving. But he's sure and true. Friends, as we close, I just, I just want to encourage you that God is moving in this church. Amen. And he has and continues to pour out his blessing because he is good. But it is also not lost on me that he has gathered a faithful people to call Newbridge their church home over the past 10 years since we started this thing. And he's looking for us as we grow and expand into this community to see spiritually and trust that he wants to continue to do a mighty work in our midst. You know, this is, uh, some of you have heard me mention before that I'm a part of this ministry called Pause. And a couple times a year, we have an intensive workshop, which is four days long. It used to be five, but now it's four. And so I, for the past two days, and I'm going back there this afternoon, have been in the room that we started this church in. With all of its 
decorations and smells. And I can tell you, as I look there and think about our beginnings, when there were more people on, up front on the worship team than were in the, in the chairs, God has brought us a long way, hasn't he? Amen. He's good. He's in this thing. And part of that is because many of you, some of you have been there since the beginning. Joanna and, and Russ and uh, you know, some of you just been, you've been here faithful, praying for us, committed to this thing because you know that God is in it. And so in those early days as we looked out, oh gosh, what are we doing, right? How is this thing going to work out? It has worked out. But I don't want to stop there. I want to see God continue to work in our midst. And trust me, friends, that's going to take you and me being faithful to his call. Amen? Amen. We could see that God was up to something in those early days. And look at where we are now. So my challenge to all of you, both personally and corporately, is to have the kind of faith that doesn't need to know all the answers, but looking for what God is going to do and walking with him on the journey. I've been walking that journey for 10 years when it comes to Newbridge, not perfectly, I might add, but forward nonetheless. And I'm committed to continue that work, continue that walk, and walk on that journey for as long as God would have me to do so. And I'm wondering this morning, would you join me on that journey? Would you continue to walk with me along the road and see God continue to write his story here in Morristown and beyond? I guess somebody's telling me it's, t- it's time. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward and uh, let's, let's pray together. Would you stand with me as I, uh, as, as I pray for us? Father, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness to us. I pray for my friends here, young and old, uh, new guest, long-time attender, members, everybody in this room and everybody listening to me online that you'd spur within them a deep faith, that trust in, trust in the one who knows it all. I pray for a deep-rooted faith and steps in your direction. Lord, we want to walk with you. We don't want to walk against you. We don't want to walk away from you. We want to walk with you. And we want to see you do mighty, powerful things in our midst. And not only that, but we want to, we want to be used by you And so help us to have the faith that is required to walk with you and walk in your will and walk in your plans and see you do mighty things. Give us your eyes, Lord. We sang that earlier in the beginning of the worship uh, service. Give Give us your eyes, Lord, that we can see what you're up to. That we would look past the temporary and the temporal and the earthly things and we would see your heavenly work at hand. In Jesus' name. Amen.